by every bird in the sky and every flower that's blooming that we serve a good God who is still on the throne. And we want you to know that we love you. And we're going to have church tonight. We are going to have church tonight. Hey, we're going to honor the Lord. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to let him know that we still know that he's good, that he's worthy to be praised. So you all come on in and join with us. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. It doesn't matter who's beside you or who's not. The Lord is there. He's able to be there. So let's invite him and let's, let's honor him tonight with our praise. Let's worship him tonight with everything that we've got because he deserves it.
let him know that we still believe yes, Lord. that he has overcome. And because of that, we are going to lift him up. Yes. We know that our victory is in Jesus' name. We take authority over fear yes. and things that would try to stop us from believing that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The victory belongs to our Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care what the news says. Yes. I don't care what your bank account says. I don't care what your job says. Our victory is in the name of Jesus. Jesus. And if you Jesus. are covered under the blood, then you belong to him along with everything else that he owns. It belongs to you. Thank we you, are heirs. Thank you for the anointing, Lord. Thank you for promises. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for keeping your promises to us. Hallelujah. We honor you, Lord. We thank you Jesus, for your love. Jesus, you're we worthy. thank you for every drop of blood worthy, God. that you shed on the cross of Calvary to prove your Jesus, love to us. You're worthy. To show you what you mean to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For I spoke a word, you see for me.
good to see you on this Wednesday evening. We're so thankful that you have joined in with us and hopefully you'll hit the share button there in the next few minutes and get a bunch more folk to uh, join in with us. It's time for us to prepare our heart for giving and I just want to say right up front, thank you church for all that you're doing. Thank you that you're continuing to give even though we can't be together here in this sanctuary. People are driving by and giving their gifts people are giving online uh yesterday morning uh real early somebody came by and brought a gift and and uh offerings to the church while you prepare your heart i want to read you a little short story here uh it's called and then some it says a successful businessman was once asked the secret of his success his reply summed up success in three words. Those three words were, and then some. He learned early in his life that the difference between average people and the truly successful people could be summed up in those three words. Top people did what was expected, and then some. Yeah. Jesus taught the, and then some, principle also in his scripture. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too, Matthew 5, 41. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so, Matthew 5, 47. So Jesus was teaching, not only do we do what we know we're supposed to do, but then we do the and then some, and then some extra. And I want to say thank you again for some of you guys are doing and then some. I've been looking at some of the tithes and some of the offerings and, and, and been praising the Lord and just thanking God for what's coming in and, and realizing that some of you guys are doing the and then some because you're realizing some folk are out of work and they have no income. Some folk don't have a flow coming in so they can't continue to give so you're taking up the slack and i want to say how much i really really appreciate that uh, mother Teresa's is coming up here just in a minute to bless the offering and we want you to continue to have your offering before the lord and continue the flow of those gifts going uh through you from the lord back to the Lord, through the people. And God's so wonderful about that happening, making that happen. Please remember as we steam toward Easter, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff on Facebook, and I'm sure you have too, about how the, the church is empty, but hey, the grave is too. And uh, we're going to celebrate. Easter is going to happen. 
at our house. Easter is going to happen at Rio East Church. We're going to enjoy the presence of God. We're going to have one of the greatest Easter's that we've ever had. And I'm excited about that. Looking forward to it. So sorry that we can't see you guys in person and, and give you a hug. But uh, listen to me. If you'll let him, the Holy Spirit will hug you. And I send you a hug right now. A virtual hug in the name of the Lord. Me and my mom, we've been having to do this. And all of you guys, we'll do this to you tonight. We hug you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Let's bless this offering. And then I have a couple of announcements. Hello, Rio East family. We love you and miss you. Let's pray. Our Father, we just come to you right now with thanksgiving from our hearts. We thank you, God, for the blessings that you pour out upon us. We thank you, yes, Lord, Lord, that Jesus, you made a way yes, Lord, so Lord. that we could give because you gave first. Lord, I thank Lord. you for every gift that is being given, every, every offering, money that has come in. God, I ask you to bless I it abundantly, multiply it, God. Let it go further than it's ever went before to further your kingdom in these Hallelujah. last days. God, we just Lord. give you praise and honor. Thank you for those that may not have the time and the money right now to give, but you will bless them, Lord. You'll see their heart and help them to Jesus. prosper. God, we just ask your blessings upon Jesus. every area of Good. every life, God. And in the rest of this service, touch Good. Pastor, Lord, and help him as he delivers the word that it go forth to accomplish that which you've sent for it for it to do tonight, Lord. We praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, honey. Have you ever heard the old saying that you're as nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs? Any of y'all ever heard that? Especially a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. That's how I feel tonight. God's laid a message on my heart, and I'm as nervous as I've ever been. And I want you to pray. Because I know that when I'm as tore up as I am, God is fixing to do something. So I want you guys to be praying. Those of you that are ministers, those of you that are leaders at Rio East, I'm asking you during these next two songs, get a hold of God and let the Holy Ghost minister through the word of the Lord, through these songs, through the anointing. I believe it's coming into the airways. I believe the anointing of God is in your house. He said we're two or three were gathered in His name. He would be there. Please remember Sunday morning. Uh, get dressed up in your house. At least fix yourself up or, or put your better pair of pajamas on. Ladies, do something to your hair. Put a little makeup on. Your husband called me and told me that he wanted you to put a little makeup on. I'm, I'm kidding. Hallelujah. But listen to me. We need to prepare for the presence of God. We need to be ready for the anointing of the Spirit of God. And if the Lord tarries till Sunday, right after the first song, right after Miss Joy and the team does the first song, we're going to be participating in communion. We've been announcing this. We're going to do it together. If you don't have juice, if you don't have the right crackers, don't sweat it. I'm sure you've got uh, water and bread in your house. Uh, Brother Charlie Maloney said the Lord can turn the water into wine, and he still can do that. So uh, just remember, we're going to do that together on Sunday morning, right after the first song, as we walk into the presence of the Lord and enjoy the anointing of God. Uh, on Sunday evening, Easter Sunday evening, this team has been working hard. You guys have had some time off. You haven't had to get out of the house and come to the church uh, you haven't had to drive in, but this team have been working. They've been working hard. They've been praying. They've been practicing. They've been preparing. And Sunday afternoon, uh, we're going to take off. We're going to have some family time. We're going to spend some time off asking that you do the same thing. I know that some of you are still meeting with families on a limited basis, and you're still having Easter. So uh, take Sunday evening and enjoy that time. And uh, I can't think of anything else right now to announce. I'm sure I probably forgot something because, like I said, I'm twisted up. I'm excited about what God is going to do tonight. Please pray and ask God to touch somebody's heart that don't know Him. Ask God to touch somebody that they'll turn on their telephone or turn on their Facebook and that the anointing of God will reach out through them and touch and minister as only God can do. Somebody's going to get a breakthrough tonight. Somebody, the light's going to come on. I know that the Lord has given me a word and God's going to touch and minister to people's hearts tonight. Joy, honey, come on, would you? Thank you.
Lord, so that you can come in. Help us to get out of the way. Lord, so that you can do what it is that you want to do. We praise you and we thank you tonight for that. Help us to honor you with our faith. To honor you with our trust. To honor you with our belief in who you are and what you're able to do. We thank you for that. Thank you that you're trustworthy.
This coming Friday, Good Friday is what we're preaching about tonight. We are asking for everyone who can to please fast and pray and seek the face of the Lord for a couple of things. Number one, for this stinking uh, virus to get blowed out of here and uh, for it to get finished up and done. And number two, that the Lord would bless in a phenomenal way on Easter Sunday morning in all the churches across our land, across our world. So be fasting and praying about that on Friday, if you will. I know some of you, some of us, have been fasting this week and seeking the face of the Lord in uh, different ways, different fashions. Some of you have given up one meal, some two meals, some different things. And God sees that. He knows your heart. He knows everything about us. So... Let's get into the message tonight. I feel like that I weigh somewhere around 400 pounds with my shoulders. They are weighted down with the Word of God. I feel like that I have a wagon that's absolutely loaded, and I am going to unload that wagon tonight with the grace and the help and the mercy of the Lord. I pray that you will stick with us. It's going to take a little while. Uh, we don't have any air conditioning running in here tonight, and uh, I've got a coat on. I come to church early this morning and didn't bring my dress clothes, and I had a jacket downstairs, and I put it on. So forgive me if I come out of the jacket. Forgive me if I come out of the shirt. That's about as far as I'll go. So praise the Lord. Welcome to Rio East Midweek Refueling. We're looking tonight on what's really good about Good Friday. What's really good about Good Friday? Maybe you've heard all your life Good Friday. Maybe you've heard it celebrated Good Friday. Maybe you've heard it talked about Good Friday and you couldn't figure out really what is the good in Good Friday. And I know that people say, well, the good God and the grace of God offered His Son and He died on Good Friday and that's what made it good. And that's exactly right. That made it good. That made our salvation available it made us able so that's part of it but i want to dig on into it it's so much deeper than that someone uh, that used to go to our church many years ago 
accused uh, myself and our ministry of being very shallow and uh, of only being interested in getting people saved and getting people out of the ditch. But they made a statement and they said that the ministry doesn't go deep. The ministry is only shallow and they only teach and preach about salvation. Well, I hope you're listening tonight if you were the one that made that comment because tonight we're jumping off of the big diving board. We're going way in and I'm trusting that God is going to minister to each of us all the way through this. You know, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, all the way back from Adam and Eve, Ever since that point, there's been a barrier between humanity and God. There's been a barrier. There's been a wall. There's been a divider. There's been a separation. There's been something that stopped man from being able to get in connection with God. And I'm speaking to several people tonight that all of your life you walked with a barrier between you and God. You haven't been able to get into what you feel like is the plan of God. Some of you, you reached through that barrier just a little bit and, and you sampled that clear air on the inside of the barrier for a little while. But then before long, you found yourself snatched back out and you again had that barrier between you and God. I want to tell you tonight, this is your message. God sent me to tell you, if you'll listen, if you'll obey, if you'll believe, God will break the barrier in your life and He'll help you to see that it's simple. It's easy. Jesus Christ already did it. It's done. It's taken care of. Amen. But we need to walk through it tonight. We need to think about it. We need to study about it. The Bible says, how can they know unless there be a preacher? There's a preacher tonight. God sent me, loaded my wagon, and I have a message for you. What's really good about Good Friday the first thing I want to talk to you about is the veil. The veil. You know about the veil. Exodus 26, verse number 31. I want you to think about that veil in your spirit now. I want you to get this into your mind. And when somebody asks you about the veil of the Old Testament, I want you to have a word to be able to tell them. The Bible says that we need to have an answer to every man that asks us of this good news, that asks us of our salvation. We need to have an answer. God, touch us tonight and help us to minister this word to the people that are out there in this, in this Facebook audience. God, people that maybe are all over the world listening to this message. And God, the people that may listen tomorrow and, and the days to come. And God, for the thousands and the ten thousands, I speak a prophetic word tonight to them in the name of Jesus. And I believe, God, that you broke the barrier. And the reason that you broke it is because... You wanted to be close to mankind. You wanted to have that fellowship again. The ones you love, the ones you created, the ones you made in your image. So tonight as we look at this barrier, God, as we look at this veil, open our spirit and help us. God, if we're on the outside of the veil, help us to realize that all we need to do is walk through I ask these favors in that wonderful name that's above every name. God, I ask you to hide me behind that wonderful cross. Let your blood cover each individual and let the power of your anointing pull people from where they are. Embrace, God, through the power of your spirit, I pray. And in Jesus' name. And the church shouted, Amen, amen. Exodus 26 and 31. And you shall make a veil of blue. Now get this picture in your mind. Those of you that are like uh, Miss Eileen, maybe you, you deal with fabric. Maybe some of you ladies make things and you sew stuff. And at least us guys that are kind of dense when it comes to the fabrics and those kind of things, we can relate and we can understand colors. Blue is a, a beautiful color. I was looking at the sky the other day, Joy, out on the back porch, and I looked up at the sky, and I thought, dear God, I can almost see into heaven. The blueness of the sky and the white puff of a cloud every now and then is just absolutely magnificent. But make the veil of blue. And then, as you make it out of blue, my goodness, attach a little bit of purple. 
Put purple in there. And then of all things and scarlet. So we got blue and we got purple and we've got scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. Just the normal seamstress would never do. It had to be fine twined linen with cunning work. And then listen to this. With cherubims shall it be made. With cherubims shall it be made. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying we've got a fabric here that's being made. It's made out of blue and purple and scarlet. And in that fabric, there are cherubims that are made all through it from the artisans that were, were making this fabric. It had to be explicitly made, beautifully made. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying within the holy place of the tabernacle, there was an inner room that was called the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. Judging from its name, we can see that it was a most sacred room, a place no ordinary person could ever enter. It was God's special dwelling place in the midst of His people. During the Israelites wandering in the wilderness, God appeared as a pillar of cloud or fire in and above the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was a perfect cube. Its length, its width, and height were all equal to 15 feet. So it's 15 wide, 15 long, 15 tall. It was a perfect cube. A thick curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. This curtain, known as the veil, was made of fine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarn. It was approximately 60 feet in height, 30 feet in width, and at least 4 inches thick. There were figures of cherubim embroidered onto it. Cherubim were in the presence of God to demonstrate His almighty power and His majesty. They also guarded the throne of God. The word veil in Hebrew means a screen or a divider or a separator that hides. What was this curtain hiding? Essentially, it was shielding a holy God from sinful man. Whoever entered into the Holy of Holies was entering the very presence of God. In fact, anyone except the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies would definitely die. Even the high priest God's chosen mediator with his people could only pass through the veil and enter this sacred dwelling only once a year on a prescribed day called the Day of Atonement. The picture of the veil was that of a barrier between man and God showing that the holiness of God could not be trifled with. God's eyes are too pure to look on evil and he can tolerate no sin found in Habakkuk 1.13. The veil was a barrier to make sure that man could not carelessly and irreverently enter into God's awesome presence. Even as the high priest entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he had to make some meticulous preparations. He had to wash himself. He had to put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let the smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of God. And he had to bring blood. Did you hear me? I said he had to bring blood with him to make atonement for the sins. So the presence of God remained shielded from man behind a thick curtain all during the history of Israel. That curtain that shielded man from God. There was one place in the Old Testament that talked about how that if God came down, they had to draw a line around the mountain and God would come down on the mountain. And God instructed them. He said, when you see and hear the thunderings and the lightnings, He said, if anything touches the mountain, it'll die. Yes. You had to build a fence. There was a shield. There was a veil. There was a barrier. And in some of your lives tonight, you know who I'm talking to. 
just as sure as I'm standing here sweating in this pulpit, you know that there's a barrier between you and God. There's something there that's keeping you and has kept you from the plan and the perfect will of God in your life. Some of you, you've tasted and you've seen that God is good, but you're unwilling to walk in through that veil and have communion and sacrifice and fellowship with the King. There's a barrier. There's a barrier there. I'm asking you tonight to consider. I'm asking you tonight to listen really close. Because the Lord has made it very, very simple for us to get through that barrier. Yes. You see, there's some things as I've studied for all these years. There's some things that I've missed that absolutely I just read over. And I guess it was the thing that stood out to me this Easter season as I was looking and studying into the Word of God. The thing that stood out to me was the cherubim that was sewn into the fabric. Why would cherubims be sewn into fabric? Why would that be? Cherubim were given the description of being uh, awesome or almost so powerful and almost so uh, frightening that there was something that you were afraid to look at. Something that guarded the presence of God. But as we walk into this message tonight, that veil that stood for all of those thousands of years, that veil that was carried there through the wilderness in the tabernacle tent and then on into the city of Jerusalem in that temple, that veil stood there and it protected or it separated God from His people. It kept common man from being slaughtered by a holy God. It kept people out of the presence of the Lord. Yes. But there come a day. <laughs> Say that with me. There came a day. Came a day. Say it again. There came a day. Came Are you saying that in your home? There came a day. It was a good day. Yes. It actually was Good Friday. That day was a day that the veil was ripped in two. The veil was ripped in two. Jesus. Matthew 27, 50. When he had heard, or when he had cried again with a loud voice, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. From top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. Going on, Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, pay attention to this, his flesh. Amen. That is to say, his flesh. Now let's start digging in a little bit deeper and I'm going to start trying to make some progress here. And hopefully you'll pick up this and it'll be something that will really bless you and help you to be able to explain what God really did through Jesus. What is the good that happened on Good Friday? We see so much in the Word of God about the tabernacle, how it ties in with the Garden of Eden and how the whole plan of salvation is getting us back to the Garden again. The entire Bible is a revelation of God's restoration of what God gave to man and that man had forfeited due to sin. In our text tonight, notice that cherubims were sewn into the veil, the barrier, which stood before the holiest of holies. And we find that this veil ripped open when Jesus Christ died. You see, the barrier was removed. Can I hear an amen? The barrier was removed. And of course, this lined up with access to the tree of life as found in Genesis once again. I said it lined up and give us ability to get into the tree of life 
once again like Adam and Eve had in the day of Genesis, in the day of the garden. So let's go on a little further. Let's talk about those cherubims. They were the protectors or the guardians. Genesis 3 and 24. Yeah, we're going all the way back to the garden. Genesis 3 and 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Ezekiel 10, 18 through 20. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims and the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them and everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Verse 20, this is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar. And I knew that they were the cherubims. The veil upon which the cherubims were embroidered was on the east side of the most holy place. Are you listening to me tonight? God makes no mistakes. Everything lines up. Every I is dotted. Every T is crossed. Can you hear me? I preached Sunday. Last Sunday, God was making preparation. Can I tell you? Good Friday is a culmination of preparation. Glory to God. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost tonight. Can I tell you? God has your best interest at heart. The veil upon which the cherubim were embroidered was on the east side of the most holy place. And here in Ezekiel's vision of the temple, we see the cherubims at the east gate of the Lord's house. They were at the east. Also, in the Garden of Eden, can you hear me tonight? Looking on into Ezekiel 11, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looked eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw J. Azaniah, the son of Azur, and Pilata, the son of Beniah, princes of the people, then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel to the city. So Ezekiel saw cherubims at the east gate of the Lord's house. And then he was taken to the east gate and he was shown men that were devising mischief in the city. In other words, these men were ungodly men. And such ungodliness caused the glory of God to leave the temple. The cherubims were there at the east gate where these wicked men were just as they were at the east of the garden to protect the way of life when Adam was cast out. They were always around the glory of God. The cherubim, protectors, keepers of the glory of God. But then we have Christ, the mercy seat. You see, the mercy seat is Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated as mercy seat is also translated as propitiation. And Christ is set forth to be a propitiation for our sins. So Christ is the mercy seat for my sins. But here we see a veil with the pictures of the cherubim sewn into it. Don't lose that picture in your mind. That veil that's over four inches thick. Blue and purple with all the beautiful colors and the cherubims being sewn into it. Hebrews 10.22 said that the veil represents the flesh of Jesus Christ. Yes. The veil represents the flesh of Jesus Christ. I was always wondering what reasons cherubims were sown into the veil of the Holy of Holies. The veil is the flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, he opened the way up for you and me. The way of the tree of life 
was being protected by the cherubims in the garden. In Revelation 2, we find that God said, those who overcome will eat of the, free, of the tree of life, eat of the fruit of the tree of life. We therefore knew that the way to the tree of life had to be accessible once again by reading of it being protected in Genesis and by reading the idea of God granting His people to eat of its fruit again. Adam could not eat of it after he sinned. There was a cherubim there. <laughs> My friend, what's wrong with a lot of folks tonight? There's a barrier that's still hanging between you and the holiness of God. What's wrong with a lot of people tonight? You failed to understand that the cherubim, that cherubim that's sewn into that fabric has been broken. It's been torn in two. It no longer exists. You don't have to go through a man and get him to pray for you. You don't have to go through a person and get him to get to God for you. But oh my God, you can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Mercy and help. Amen, God. Adam could not eat of it after he sinned. There was a cherubim there. God said to those who overcome, He will grant to eat of that tree. Adam had sin and he could not eat. Those who overcome can eat. Yeah. What is the explanation, Brother Dale? It's as plain as day. And it's the good of Good Friday. Sin is what keeps man from being able to pass through the way and eat of the fruit of life once again. Sin is what must be overcome. So let's go to Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through verse number 21. And let's look at that, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, Paul said, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. What's wrong, Paul? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So that's it, Brother Dale. Because I've got sin in my mortal body, I can't get to God. Nothing can fix that because I can't live a perfect, righteous life. I can't do it. I've spun my wheels all my life and I haven't been able to do it yet. That's where somebody is tonight. Verse 18. For I know that in me, Paul speaking, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me. I'd like to. But how to perform that which is good, I can't find it. I find not. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. What's wrong, Paul? Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, when I would do good, evil is present. Notice all the references that Paul made to good and evil. And in the middle of it all, we read this. Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Paul said dwells no good thing. Sin dwelleth then in Paul. In Paul's flesh dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, 24. As John Richardson says, I'm going somewhere. Go with me. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? We read of good and evil. Evil and good and death. Sounds a lot like Genesis, does it not? Chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God said we would die if we ate of the knowledge of good and evil. God does not want us concerned with good and evil, but he wants us concerned with life. Life. Paul was all wrapped up in what was good and what was evil. And the more he tried to be good, the more he tried to know it better, the worse he became. The more fat we eat, the more fat we become. Amen? I can vouch for that. The more death we eat, the more death we experience. And notice what goes along together with death in the last part of Romans chapter 8, verse number 2. The law of sin and death. So sin and death go hand in hand. Death came by sin, and that's exactly what God tried to tell Adam. Paul found that sin was in his flesh and all his rants about what was good and evil did not help him at all. In fact, he wound up screaming, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? The devil will use religion. Good and evil sounds so religious. God had a tree of life. So the devil used a tree too. But it's a matter of life and not good or evil knowledge. Flesh has no good thing dwelling in it. Now Jesus' flesh was seen in the veil of the temple. When Jesus' flesh died, the veil was torn wide open. The veil that had the cherubim sewn into it was torn open when Jesus died. Adam could not go in because of his sin. The cherubims protected the way. Are you listening? The children of Israel went into the holy place, but they could not go into the holy of holies. The cherubim were there in the veil, in the protector, in the barrier, in the screen that kept people from God. Why? Because sin was in the flesh. Paul felt that he had to be delivered from the body of death, the flesh of death. If he could only get out of his body so he could leave behind the sin that kept him out of the garden so he could eat of the fruit of life again. He was dying. Trying to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil by his repeated stress on good and evil was killing him faster and faster. What could he do? Who could deliver him? And then he found it. Romans chapter 7, verse number 25. I thank God through Christ Jesus. Amen. God would deliver him. Deliver him from the body of death. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then we began to read about something other than good and evil and sin and death. Romans 8 and 2 again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What did it? Jesus yes. tore up the cherubims. <laughs> flushed them. Tore them apart. So that you, while you were still in your sin could be saved yes. by the presence of an almighty God. Amen. But I'm not done there yet. Life, life, life. That's the form of the tree of life. That's what it's in today. God delivering us from the body of sin through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. Because one goes through a way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Romans 7, 25, through Jesus Christ. Romans 8 and 2, in Christ Jesus. Both speak about Jesus' death. Whenever we read about being in Christ, it refers to having trusted in something so that it puts us in Him. What is that something that puts us in Him? What has it got to do with the sin in our flesh? What has it got to do with the deliverance from this body of death? How does it get us past the barrier that keeps sin out? That something is Jesus' death. 
When I was baptized, I was put into Jesus' death. Romans 6 and 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You see, when Jesus died, he died to set us free. He died in our place. We should have died, but he died. The sin that was in our flesh, no matter how good we try to be, no matter how we tried to avoid evil, it held us down tight. Sin kept us out of the garden where life was. Our sin brings death. Death came by sin, and death comes still by sin. Sin is in our flesh. In a sense, God really did deliver us out of our sinful flesh, our body of death. Because when we believe that Jesus died for us, then we believe that He died, and we believe that we died. We died. See, that's what's necessary for us to believe. Yes. There's a scripture that says, should we continue on in sin? And then it answers, God forbid. We're dead unto sin. Amen. Dead unto sin. His flesh hung on the cross and died in our place. And since it was our place, then it paid our debt of death. The reason the cherubim were sewn into the veil, the reason the veil was ripped when Jesus' flesh died on the cross was because my faith in Jesus caused me to have been crucified with Christ. He was the veil, the flesh that died. And I was in Christ when Christ died because I believe Mike Boring, I believe that he did it for me. Yes. Jimmy, I believe that he did it for me. They that come to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible, impossible to please God. Without faith, you walk in your sins every day. Without faith, you face a barrier every day. Without faith, and in the finished work of Jesus Christ, realizing that Christ on the cross took the flesh, destroyed the cherubims, tore down the barrier between you and God, and opened up the access door to the tree of life. I could go on and on tonight. There are promises after promise that talks about how that we who are the children of God will never die. Why will we never die? Because we have access to the tree of life. Yes. Where is the tree of life? It's in the holy place. How do you get into the holy place? Jesus said, Joy, he said, I'm the way. The truth and the life. You can't get to the Father any other way. Let's bring this thing to a close. You guys want to come on back up. The cherubim were in the veil when it ripped. That occurred simultaneously with Jesus' death. When he looked down through the tunnel of time, when he hung on that cross that fateful day, that Good Friday. He looked down through time. He saw you and me. And he said. It is finished. Yeah. When he said that. Your Bible says. The veil in the temple. Rent from the top to the bottom. Mm. The cherubim were torn in half. <laughs> What's that mean pastor? Jesus. Was there. To tear down the barrier. Yes. His flesh. Had to carry your sin. And you and I. Have to die. With him. That should happen at water baptism. That should happen when we give our life to Jesus. When we're born again. When we kneel at an old fashioned altar. Or we kneel at a stump. Or we get behind the steering wheel. And we say God take me. Take my life. I surrender all. We die to this flesh. 
in Christ by faith and we have access. We died with Jesus Christ. The way opened up for me to go to the tree of life and I came through Jesus' death. He's the way. I died with Christ because I was in Christ. You have any more proof, Brother Dale? Just a little more if you need it. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When you're saved, when you're born again, behold, all things become new. The old man dies. The old man dies. In the spirit, we're a brand new creation. Paul struggled with it. I struggle with it. You struggle with it. But it's by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that we defeat this flesh. And the cherubims are torn asunder. And we have opportunity to walk into yes. the presence of God. All we have to do is truly believe. There's no way for us to come to God and have eternal life except through the death of Jesus Christ in our place. One more scripture and I'm finished. My wagon is just about unloaded. John 6, 26 through 29, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, or in other words, better listen up, guys. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me. Not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Glory to God, sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God. Here you go again. Religion is coming on the scene. What am I going to do? How am I going to be perfect? Jesus answered and said unto them, Here it is, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him. <laughs> that you believe on Him who He hath sent. That you believe on Him who He hath sent. Well, who is that? Who has He sent? We know that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would never perish but have everlasting life. So who did He send? God sent Jesus. And because of Jesus, and because He hung on the cross, and because His flesh was the veil, because His flesh was dead and died, we died in Christ. How do we get this life? What work do we have to do? It's very simple. We believe. It causes the veil to rip in your life. It causes the barrier to go away for you. You die in Him. And the sin that held you out is gone. And Good Friday is good indeed. I said Good Friday is good indeed. Because the cherubim are now no longer protecting. But Jesus said you have an invitation come boldly. Brother Dale, I'm not good enough. Brother Dale, when I get this habit taken care of. Brother Dale, when I get this prison sentence behind me. Brother Dale, when I get this fixed. Brother Dale, when I get my marriage reconciled. Brother Dale, when I get made up with my children. Brother Dale, when I get this, that, and the other done. No! While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All you have to do is believe. Believe. All you have to do is believe. They're going to do a song, whatever they've selected, and when they get done, I want to pray with you. I want you to believe. 
Maybe you're like that man in the scripture that said, Lord, help my unbelief. Sometimes I pray that prayer. And he always does. We must believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Anything in addition to Christ is religion. You can't get good enough. Paul found it out. You'll never be perfect in your flesh. You say, Brother Dale, I have to sin a little every day. I don't teach that either. Should we continue in sin? God forbid. But us not continuing in sin is not our salvation. Did you hear me? When you're in the middle of sin, you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And He saves you because you died with Him. And you're raised a new creation. Washed in the blood. Good Friday is good indeed.
Hallelujah, that reckless love of God is what we're talking about tonight. Are you ready to pray with us right now? Drop your head, stretch your heart out to God. Say, Father, I've lived my life with a, a barrier between you and me. Lord, all my life I've tried to be good enough. I've tried so many different ways. Lord, I've tried this religion, this denomination, that denomination. I've tried this work, that work. I've tried this exercise and that. Lord, I've always felt like I've come up short. Tonight, oh God, I come by faith in the Son of God. Tonight, I come by faith asking you to forgive me of my sins and asking you to allow me to die in Christ to be raised a brand new creation, to the newness of life, to the new desires, to the new wants, to the new needs. Touch my life, oh God. Help me to concentrate on life, not death. I need you, Lord. I give you me. Lord, I rededicate my life tonight. I give you all of me. I ask you to help me to not worry about the veil any longer. But help me to come to you. You said you would give me the will to come and the ability to get it done. The will and the do. I trust you, Lord. I need you. I praise you. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Church, thank you for your attention tonight. Only 10 minutes over what we would have gone if you were here. So thank you for sticking with us. I pray that you will put some comments in. Let us know your decisions. Let us know what you did, what God did for you. Let us know so we'll know how to pray. If you have special prayer requests, special needs. If you need to talk to me personally, 257-0007. Call me. I love to pray with you. Love to talk with you. If you need food, if you need anything, we want to help you. We're here to help We've got access to food. We've got access to assistance. Whatever you need, give us a call. Let us know. Don't sit on your knee. Come and let the brothers and sisters of Christ be the church to you. God bless you. We love you. As they sing just a little more, we're going to close out this last part. I love you. Go with God. He'll always go with you.
for, we can all be excited about. And I've heard people say, you know, this is Friday, but Sunday's coming. This is Wednesday, Friday's coming, but Sunday's coming after that. And we're going to praise the King. Y'all join back here with us on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday at 1030. We love you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.